you got to operate in truth, right? Operate in truth. You know, tell the truth. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Gator Truth Florida Football Podcast. On this episode, we're going to take a look at Florida's 24-17 victory over the Missouri Tigers in the homecoming game, and we're going to break down the good, the bad, and the ugly for the offense, defense, and special teams. Let's get right in it, and let's start on the offense, and let's start with the quarterback position. Anthony Richardson only threw for 66 yards and was 8 of 14 passing. Generally, these are not good numbers, and I'm not going to say that they are. However, there is a little bit of keys to what we're talking about, and some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of it is the good is he had a chance to complete really 10 of 14 passes. In the second half, he hit his receiver all six throws. Four of those were completions. One went to shorter on the corner route deep, and shorter just did not hang on to it. The last one, he did get Pearsall in both hands. It was a high throw. Would have been a hard catch. I do expect a starting receiver at Florida to make some hard catches. But also in that situation, the safety did make a nice play to bat the ball away. It, was, it could have been a better throw. So with that said, I'm giving this more on the accuracy side of things. Accuracy could have been a little better on percentage if we make some catches. But then again, he did miss some throws on the other ones. He threw first uh, incompletion throws. He throws to shorter almost on the exact opposite tight side of the field. The same play that he hit shorter on a few plays earlier for a 20-yard gain on the first play of the game. Nice diving play by the defensive back there to break up the pass. Then moving on, he did miss two of the swing or screen passes. The reason why I say swing or screen is because the one to Henderson definitely seemed to be a little bit more of a swing, A, because Henderson was running before the ball was thrown. That one, Henderson reacted like he should have grabbed it. I'm not quite sure. He did put it more. Aunt Richardson did put the ball more north-south, where uh, Henderson was running more east-west. Generally, I want a quarterback putting it a little more north-south. That way, the receiver gets momentum going up the field. But you also have to put touch on it to get the ball in a little bit more of an arc so the receiver has time to adjust. Richardson threw a bullet, and because he threw a bullet instead of some touch, that is where the incompletion happened. So not exactly the worst ball placement, but you got to give a little bit more of a good throw to that. Moving on to the last incompletion, because I do feel like looking at what the incompletions are tells us, is this a quarterback not reading the field? Are these just inaccurate throws, or is there something else going on? The last one was, of course, a corner out, it appeared to be, by Pearsall. He throws the ball up, and actually, on that one, he does put touch on it, which, me, which helped him kind of underthrow the ball, unfortunately. The ball hits the uh, Missouri defender on the back of the helmet, and when he hits the Missouri defender on the back of the helmet, it goes incomplete. Some people did believe that there was some PI on that uh, play. I'm not sure if there was pass interference or not. There's not face guarding in college, which I know some people say, well, he didn't look for the ball. Well, he doesn't have to in college. The thing that I would say, and I say this all the time, if you want a pass interference call, you've got to sell that you've been interfered with. If you look how Pearsall jumps, he kind of jumps and floats back instead of if he just jumps straight up or jumps forward to the ball and initiates that contact where he's taken out by the defender, then that has a different story. With that said, probably, in fact, not probably, Richardson does need to put that ball out in front of Pearsall, but it was a good read. That's the thing I can say about all of these throws by AR, and I know some people may disagree. All his incompletions were at least the right read. Unfortunately, they were incomplete for one reason or another, whether it's bad throw, bad luck on our part by a great defensive play, 
or combination thereof. Again, the last one, I've gone back and forth on Twitter with a few people. It could have, which was the interception. It wasn't necessarily the best timing. It was definitely a high throw causing Pearsall to leave his feet. However, without that safety coming and making that hit right as he's catching it, that is a catch and it is a first down. So I really don't hate that throw as much as some other people I've seen and or heard from did. AR also had some big runs for first downs in the game. The biggest probably being on the first offensive touchdown drive of the game, which was in the second half, where on fourth and two at the 35, no one's open. He pulls the ball down, runs for 32 yards, sets up a first and goal at the three. And with the first and goal at the three, we punch it in on the next play with Montreal Johnson. With all that said, I would probably give Richardson a B. I know that sounds lenient. However, with what he was asked to do, I haven't seen him not do anything too well outside of miss a few throws. And then again, we had one or two drop passes. So with that said, again, I'm giving him a B. The running backs, moving on to them. In the first half, none of them averaged over three yards per carry. They're generally in the two to three yard range. We didn't really have any long carries beyond three, four yards in the first half. The offensive line wasn't blocking too well for them, and they weren't making too many people miss in that first half. And that really put extra pressure on the rest of the offense. With that said, in the second half, they really turned it on. There were adjustments that were made. And when they were made, the running backs had several big runs. AR had a big run. And so the running backs with those big runs, a few touchdown runs as well. And I believe I counted four or five runs of double digit yards from the running backs after that, possibly more. And all three running backs did have a run of at least 10 yards in the game. I would give them a B plus. They disappeared for a half and really put extra pressure on the offense. That's why I'm not giving them quite to the A. With that said, again, they did enough of what they're asked to do in the second half and also went above and beyond that by making some big plays. Moving on to the receivers and tight ends. These guys did basically what they were asked to do in the game. There were a few nice blocks by these guys, including Shorter had one downfield on one of the big runs. However, they also missed a few blocks. I believe it was one of the first runs of the game. I got a text saying there was a lot of room open if the tight end doesn't miss the block. I can't expect, uh, you know, I talked about Shorter's uh, drop on the sideline earlier. I don't expect every ball to be caught, just like I don't expect a quarterback to throw a perfect ball every time. I understand it happens. I don't like to see it happen. But again, in football, there are times that not everything is perfection. With that said, I would generally give these guys a B. They didn't do much to be outstanding, but they didn't do much to hurt us. There's only one guy with two catches, and that was Xavier Henderson. One of the catches went for one yard, and that wasn't really a design screen necessarily. What it was was we had a few guys downfield, no one was open, and Anthony Richardson hit him to the check down or moved to the check down, which was Henderson. And unfortunately, even the check down was well covered. So that is kind of circling back to Richardson, a bit of growth. There's been a lot, a lot of talk of him not looking at his check downs or missing a check down and taking off running. Well, in that case, he hit the check down. It didn't go for what we wanted, but it was a little bit of improvement that you can take from the game, in my opinion. With that said, again, a B for the tight ends and for the receivers. Didn't do much at times to really help us. Didn't do much at times to really hurt us. And then at times did some great things like the Ricky Pearsall touchdown catch just to get in that small window and make that catch without stepping out of bounds. The offensive line, overall decent job in the second half, first half. Again, need to go back to none of our backs had more than two, three yards of carry in the first half. And some of that is on the offensive line. 
There were times that we had big pressure on Richardson. Of course, the fumble being one of them. The fumble where he probably should have taken a sack. We talked in the preseason about him not trying to force hero plays. And in that case, he tried to make a hero play, ended up being a fumble. Part of that was due to some quick pressure coming off the edge on Richardson. Now, we've seen him make good plays in that situation before. And when he makes them, he's a hero. And then when he doesn't make them, he's a bum. I know there's some argument about maybe it wasn't a fumble. To me, it looked like a fumble when I saw it live on the replays. I think the fumble's the right call. I do know that the announcer for the game thought that his arm was going forward. Who knows? But I use that again as an example of they allowed a little bit more pressure at times and didn't have a great first half. However, in that second half, they really showed up and we ended up running for a ton of yards and that helped us win the game. 120 or so of the total yards were on each backs and that includes Anthony Richardson's longest run. When you have long runs of 30, 40 yards, okay, Naquan Wright's longest was 10, but that's still a good run. That is a good reflection on the O-line. Some of this with the offense does have to do with lack of plays. I think we only ended up with 40-something snaps. And when you take into account four of which were kneel downs, it makes me wonder if the offense ever had time to get into a rhythm in this game. Part of that is on the offense continuing some drives. We did have drives that were three and out or four and out. And some of that is up to the defense to get themselves off the field, such as the first half where Missouri had the ball about 22 of the 30 minutes of the first half. To finish up with the, and the offensive line, I would also give them about a B in this game. This is a decent Mizzou defense, possibly underrated. They do did have Tyrone Hopper, the former Gator, pull up making a great game for himself, making some plays. However, that first half cannot happen. I also want to talk about the issue that I've seen coming up with play calling. And some people say it's not play calling, it's execution. Some people say yes, kind of. But it's also we have terrible play calling. I'm kind of in the middle. And what I mean by that is there are times I think play calling could be better, such as if Xavier Henderson breaks one of the longest uh, punt returns in the last six, seven years. You've got to follow that up with a shot to the end zone or trying to go down the field while Missouri's on it, on their heels. You have to take advantage of that momentum. Instead, we went dive, jet sweep to Naquan Wright, and then we went to throw a screen pass. Yes, again, that screen pass, if it connects to Henderson, he's probably got six, seven yards in a first down. However, when you've got that momentum, You've got to try and make a strike. We went really conservative with zero plays that were trying to get past the line of scrimmage. And that's when we had the ball inside our own 30 to start. We've got to try and really push the advantage there. So that's something play calling wise I do have issues with. And as far as things about you know other play calling, when we're not having success running up the middle in the first half, and the second half seemed to be more off tackle or kind of more to the outside and less in between the tackles, although there were one or two that got bumped outside. That's the teeth of the Missouri defense running right at it. I didn't think was the best idea to start off the game. And Anthony Richardson, despite what some people say, he really is best when he's throwing the ball down the middle of the field from what I've seen. And the example is the Justin Shorter 20-yard um, completion to start the game. Also, the 75-yard post route to start the Eastern Washington game. He seems, when you give him the levels, to be good there in the pocket throwing the ball. Also, when he can have a little out to the side, that's like three, four, five yards down the field. And what I mean by that is think of the Keon Zipper touchdown that started the first touchdown against Tennessee, where Zipper gets like four or five yards down the field, stops, Richardson checks down, hits him, and then Zipper was able to catch and run and make an awesome play there. Those are things that I see 
uh, Richardson doing well at. I've not seen him do too well at these screens throughout the season. And I've not really seen us do too well overall with screens throughout the season. So when I see us continuing to go back to things we're not doing too hot at, that is some questions I have on the play calling. On the flip side, yes, there needs to be execution. Henderson on the on the screen pass that we talked about when we didn't get aggressive after a big punt return. If that's executed, he's got a first down and maybe that drive ends up in a touchdown instead of a field goal. If we make some of the blocks in the first half, I talked about how I got a text. Hey, if the tight end makes that block, there's a lot of room for the running back. If we execute that, that's more execution than his play calling. You know, if we catch the ball on the corner route to shorter, that's execution, not play calling. We end up getting a touchdown on that drive. But there are things where, yes, it's play calling at times that can be frustrating, but it is also execution. So the answer is a little bit of both. I'm not going to fully absolve uh, an offense that I've seen get guys open and put up massive amount of yards and bash play calling. But I'm also not going to say that it's just execution when you have momentum and you don't do things to try and capitalize or make a big play while you have another big momentous play spurring you on. Moving on to the defense. I, despite the 370 yards we gave up, 150 yards on the ground, 220 yards through the air, I think the defense did a bit better in this game. And I know we gave up a third and 22. I know that we gave up other third downs, and that's annoying. And I'm not going to tell you that this defense was great in this game. But I think there are things that were improvements, and I'll go through and I'll tell you that. On the defensive line, Princely, you man Mielin, he had perhaps his best game of the season with three tackles for loss and a sack. He also did well holding his boundary for the most part, something he's not always done this season. In fact, at one point, it did cost him his starting position. Came out and on the first play from scrimmage, did a great job in his assignment and played great assignment football, in my opinion, throughout the game. And he gets a big tackle for loss. We also saw more great play from Chris McClellan. Dexter did well. Big Dez, who I really like, continues to improve, continues to make a difference. Before the season, the question that we had, the biggest question that we had for the defense was that defensive tackle position. I'm not here to say that it's now a strength, but it's definitely not in the top two positions that I think we have questions or things we need to fix. So that speaks volumes to both his coaching staff and to the hard work of players like McClellan and Desmond Watson, two young guys, as well as guys like Jalen Lee, who came in and had a decent game of himself. And then also players like Justice Boone, Tyree Sapp, definitely Brenton Cox. I know I usually will say those outside linebackers like Cox will be on the defensive line as far as what I'm looking at. Cox did a great job holding the edge a lot more than he had at times this season. I am pretty excited seeing that these guys making some improvements. I would also say that this defensive line did a good job helping out with contain one of their running backs, uh, which is Schrader. Last week, he had a ridiculous average of like 14.8 yards per carry against Georgia. In our game, he averaged two point something, like really low twos, 2.1 yards per carry. So definitely improvement there. The problem is their other running back averaged about six yards per carry with a long of 28. So the good and bad there, but a lot less edge issues I saw. Still not perfect but it is improvements that can be seen. I also have to give a shout out to the linebackers, especially Ventral Miller. Ventral Miller, as he gets healthier, feels better. He is going to be more of a force and helpful for this defense. 11 tackles, 10 of which were solo, and he was a major factor on both interceptions. I tweeted about it yesterday morning, and... This morning, I listened to Shane Matthews, and he said the same thing. 
Why do we say that Ventrell Miller was key on both of Jaden Hill's interceptions? Well, on the first one, he definitely redirects the receiver just enough that allows Hill to jump the route. On the second one, there are two receivers on the side that the quarterback's looking at. And Ventrell Miller eliminates one of those from the play with a nice uh, press, we'll call it. And the receiver goes stumbling, meaning that the quarterback with a guy in his face has to either take the sack or has to throw it to the other guy. The other guy just happens to have Jaden Hill right there ready to cut off the route. So definitely good game from Ventrell Miller. Great game at the running back or the linebacker position. Oh my gosh. Um, and then also Shamar James got in on the action and Amari Bernie got a sack and quietly was the Gators second leading tackler. One of the first games this season where the linebackers have been the leading tacklers as opposed to a safety being one of the top tacklers. So that is a bit of an improvement whether you see it or not, because that means we're getting to them a lot sooner without the guys getting to the third level of the defense. There was not any time in this game with Bernie, despite him being a maligned by much of the fan base player. There's no time in this game where I had a question, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, he blew something. So I've got to compliment him when he does well, and he did well this game. Moving to the nickelback position, I've got to say that Overall, Trevez Johnson, who I've had mixed feelings about, had a good game. There were a few times where I was saying, oh, they're going to throw it to him or to the player he's covering, and they did, and it ended up for completions. But he also had a few good moments where he had a tackle for loss and, of course, had tight coverage on the last play of the game, which helped seal that game, or on the last offensive play for Missouri in the game and helped seal the win for the Gators. And I can say there's improvement there because that same route pretty much was run on him against USF. I talked about the time where they had third and 10, I believe. He plays off, doesn't get tight, and the play goes for 20 yards. So kudos to him. Overall, one of our best nickelbacks this year has been Jadarius Perkins. In this game, however, he did have some good moments. I believe he had a tackle for loss as well. But on the third and 22, he was the first line of defense when that ball went out into the flat. He did not execute. He did not go keep the guy into the interior of the field, maintaining the boundary, and he did not make that tackle. He was not the last guy with an opportunity to tackle before a first down on third and 22. But if he executes and makes the play, then it doesn't have to be worried about who else was there and maybe didn't make the play. So, but with that said, he's been solid on film throughout the year. I have no problem. Yes, it's a frustrating play. But for some of these people saying, I don't think he should be on the team, that's an overreaction. Didn't see too much of that, but I did want to address it since it was a big play for the cornerbacks. Obviously, the star of the game, MVP, is Jaden Hill, who last week did not look comfortable, did not look too great on film. Uh, As he was coming back from injury, a guy who's not played since 2020 due to injury, got a little bit extra banged up before, uh, before the season in fall camp, so he's missed the beginning of the year. It was good to see him, after all that adversity, come in first SEC game back and get two picks, including a key pick six for the game. I believe the other corners did fine. However, um, I'm not sure whether them playing so far off is because they're playing a cover three or different zone, or whether it's just they're not reacting as fast as Jaden Hill is when they see that no routes are going deep on them to move up and make a play. That's something definitely to keep an eye on moving forward but Jason Marshall overall I thought he had a decent game some of his issues were with that zone and so we'll just have to keep an eye on it moving to the safeties I really can't say there is any big plays that these guys gave up the besides one pass I think went for about 20 yards 
the longest catches of the day, which were a 23-yard and 28-yard for Mizzou. Sorry, a 27 and a 28-yard catch for Mizzou. And those were short passes where they caught the ball, such as the third and 22 conversion, caught it only two, three yards downfield at most, and then ran. So for me, that's at least we weren't giving up the big pass to Mizzou. However, we do need to react and tackle sooner in those situations. We've talked about the big one on the third and 22 conversion. But when we've had games like Tennessee where you notice the safeties not doing well or doing what they need to do, having a game like this where really there's not much you can say about them, at least calling out specifically this play or that play, that's an improvement in, them in and of itself. Whether that'll continue with LSU and some of, some of the better teams we will face, I don't know, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. I know I haven't given grades yet for the defensive line slash that outside linebacker position. I would probably give a B plus a lot better assignment football, a lot less bus, and they did create some havoc in the game, even if it doesn't show up as a ton of sacks on the stat line, although we did end up with four sacks. So overall, got to give them that B plus. The linebackers, 150 yards rushing, some of that being quarterback escapes. I'm going to go ahead and give a B to the linebackers again, B partially because of how great Ventral Miller played, and he was a big contributor to both of our interceptions of course that pick six being one that he contributed to however it was 150 yards rushing and we've got to lock that down a little bit more for the nickelbacks i'm going to give them a b minus because although they did some good things the giving up the third down on third and 22 by not making a play by perkins some of the early game uh receptions given up by johnson those are things that are going to make me drop the score down because those were times they had chances to make plays and they ended up setting up Mizzou for some better things. For the corners, I'm going to give the corners a B plus. Jaden Hill is definitely helping the curve here with his phenomenal game. Uh, I would say he was the MVP if I've not said it already. And I'd say Ventral Miller is a close second for the corners. Unfortunately, gave up some soft zone plays. I think we need to lower some of the amount of we play the soft zone. Need to coach them to tighten up a little bit more if they don't see someone getting behind them. Come forward on the closest guy, which is what we saw Jaden Hill do. But overall, 220 yards passing is not the worst thing, especially when you consider Mizzou has the top receiver in the SEC and love it. And he did play in this game. And despite his injuries, I still think holding him to under 40 yards receiving was a good job by this team. The safeties, I'm going to give them a B. They didn't do much that really stood out, but they also didn't do anything that stood out in a negative way. So with that said, there are things that can improve but there are things that I'm seeing improve, such as not blowing the containment as much on the edges, on the defensive line, seeing some of these young guys get better with their assignments and get better just in general. And that's something to really feel good about. Although this year you want it to be better. It is good to see that there is some building for the future because guys like McClellan, guys like Watson, guys like Boone and Sapp, they should continue to get better both through this year and next year and hopefully turn into a really great offense on that front as well as some of our young guys on the back end such as a Shamar James, Jason Marshall will be back next year and guys hopefully if he's back from injury, Devin Moore, Kamari Wilson, Miguel Mitchell, lots of guys we hope to see improve and be a foundation for the future of this Gators football team. That about wraps it up. With that said, I apologize for not having a Missouri preview episode. The computer I used to record this podcast did die on me. I did get it repaired over the weekend. So that is a good thing. I will have an LSU preview as long as nothing crazy happens. 
coming up this week. LSU is a big game for me. We'll get into that as we do the preview. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And as always, go Gators. <laughs>